Good morning. I'd like to call the Senate Health and Human Services Committee to order. It is Tuesday, March 19th, 2024, and we do have a quorum present. Um, this, uh, today we've got several bills that relate to hospitals and financing, and we want to make sure to have a conversation about ways that we could be addressing um, hospital um, issues and, and highlight some of those issues. And the first bill we have on the agenda is Senate File 3838, which is um, Senator Rust's bill. It relates to a supplemental medical assistance program to provide payments to a provider of level one trauma care. Welcome to our committee, Senator Rust. The Madam Chair, when the time comes, there's an amendment on a cloth I'd like to offer. It, so thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, are you talking about the the amendment that we have, the A2 amendment? Is it? Okay. I just wanted to verify. Um, Senator Rust. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I do have the A2 amendment, if um, someone would offer that in my behalf. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Senator Abler moves the A2 amendment. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Thank you, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, since the A2 amendment does um, have some significant differences from the bill as introduced, I'm going to go through it briefly. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it directs the commissioner of DHS to develop and implement a directed payment arrangement for North Memorial. And this is, this is who we are talking about in this hearing for, for me. Uh, to begin next uh, January, and it is a voluntary program. Um, the commissioner is uh, uh, required to consider directed payment um, program um, that is, uh, it's a federal program that determines a supplemental payment mechanism and intergovernmental uh, transfers the federal financing approach that uses local government dollars to be matched by the federal government. Both of these programs include federal references that are uh, summarized below in the A2 amendment. The program established in this bill must supplement, and that's very important, not supplant or replace existing Medicaid funding uh, to North. Um, <clears throat> The, um, there are contingencies in this amendment, and the commissioner must not implement the program if the federal approval has not been received prior to implementation. The entire, the entire state share of the funding from a local government has not been legally secured um, because we are not, in the amendment, we're not asking uh, for any um, uh, uh, state funding, um, and the, um, the state, as you know, is prohibited from paying the higher rates established in the program if the local funding is not legally secured. And then finally, the local government entity that is legally committed to securing the non-federal share of funding may make the contribution and in installments agreed to by the local government, North, and the commissioner. North is unique. I know that many will say that about the hospital that is their home hospital, but it certainly is for me. We serve a unique and diverse payment patient population with a high mix of uninsured, underinsured, and individuals covered through government-sponsored insurance. North's size and independence allows us to be flexible and nimble with local decision-making. North HCMC and Regions are the only three level one adult trauma centers in the metro. North serves the state and sees some of the most complex patients as a level one trauma center. Other urban hospitals have supplemental payment arrangements or additional Medicare, Medicaid <clears throat> funding to help with challenging payer mixes and government underpayment. North needs similar support. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and members, and I um, now present my witnesses. Thank you, Senator Rust. Um, I show, I have two testifiers, um, Trevor Sawalish and um, Hennepin County Commissioner Jeff Lundy. So um, whoever would like to begin, can you please? 
State your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you very much. I am Trevor Swalish. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of North Memorial. Uh, I first want to thank uh, Madam Chair for making time on the agenda to hear our bill and also express my deep gratitude to Senator Rest and all of our other authors that are here today. Uh, North Memorial has been in business for 70 years. Uh, we currently operate two hospitals, our Level 1 Trauma Center in Robbinsdale and our Maple Grove Hospital, uh, 25 clinics and an EMS division that operates all across the state. For years, we have recognized that uh, Robbinsdale Hospital was becoming more challenging in terms of its finances. We have seen the number of Medicare and Medicaid patients increase and the number of commercially insured patients decline. Both trends have been consistent and unrelenting to the point that the Robbinsdale Hospital is now 74% uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, as you all know, government programs have historically under-reimbursed compared to the cost of delivering the care, and government program reimbursement has certainly not kept pace with the significant increases borne by care delivery over the last several years. To be clear, we are in the business to deliver outstanding care to the communities that we serve. We embrace that mission, uh, but we have to be financially viable in order to do just that. In 2023, Robbinsdale Hospital lost approximately 70 million serving patients that receive unreimbursed or under-reimbursed care. Without assistance, we project that, that the Robbinsdale Hospital could lose 100 million by 2025 for that population. With Senate File 3838, we are asking the legislature to create and implement a Medicaid supplemental payments program for the Robbinsdale Hospital. CMS's supplemental payment programs to help hospitals like Robbinsdale, which have overburden of government insured patients. Supplement payment programs are common across the country. There are approximately 250 established programs in the US, more than 90 of which are for hospitals. At present, there is only one such program in Minnesota for the Hennepin County Medical Center. And I want to make clear that we, when we developed our proposal, we received assurance that North Memorial's program would in no way diminish or jeopardize the Hennepin County program. Our situation is critical. Uh, North can no longer sustain the losses that a Robbinsdale Hospital payer mix represents. Last week, we implemented reductions that reduced our force by over 100 team members. And we have closed or downgraded key services for the communities. I deeply regret that this will result in reduced access that uh, will come as these programs wind down. But when we are looking at our costs going up more than 5% and our revenues increasing only a fraction of that uh, for three quarters of our volume, there really was no alternative. I want to be clear that these initial cuts do not solve our problem going forward. We need the kind of assistance that the Medicaid Supplemental Pro Payments Program would uh, allow for. As many of you know, North is a small but very impactful independent healthcare system that truly has statewide significance. We have clinics in five metro counties. Our ground ambulance operates in more than 20 counties throughout Minnesota, and our nine helicopters service all of Minnesota. For years, we have brought exceptional care to the communities that need us irrespective of a patient's ability to pay or what insurance card they hold or whether or not they hold an insurance card at all. Our organization is made up of over 6,500 team members and hundreds of employed and independent physicians. In my experience since joining North Memorial, I have been taken by the fact that all who chose, choose to call North their home are fiercely dedicated to that mission. To this point, we have not asked for help in the past uh, and have brought tens of millions to serve those patients because of that dedication. We hope to do well, well into the future um, because we're important to the communities that we serve. Madam Chair and members, your support for this important bill will allow North Memorial to address the crisis we face now in Robbinsdale Hospital. And once again, I thank you for your time and your consideration. Happy to an answer any questions, of course. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Lundy. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Well, Chair Wicklin, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of Senate File 3838. My name is Jeff B. Lundy. I'm Hennepin County Commissioner. I represent District 1, which includes the cities of Robbinsdale, Crystal, New Hope, Osseo, Brooklyn Center, and Brooklyn Park. On behalf of Hennepin County, I wish to express our support for Senate File 3838. Healthcare access has been identified by Hennepin County Board as one of our three legislative priorities. This legislation ensures county residents will maintain access to quality health care, and we are in complete support of this effort. 
While we own the state's largest safety net healthcare system, it is one of our one part of our overall commitment to our 1.3 million residents to ensure each of them has the right type of care at the right time in the most accessible way possible. While we stretch ourselves to find new ways to support our health systems, we know that this is shared work, shared responsibility, and as importantly, continued partnerships with institutions like North Memorial. We applaud your effort to expand the ways the state of Minnesota can protect the financial vitality of all safety net level one trauma centers. An example of this partnership is our partnership for the adult response team, which is a partnership between the Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center Police Departments, Hennepin County Social Workers, and just as importantly, North Memorial Community Paramedics. We're able to provide mental health response to 911 calls, freeing up public safety resources to focus on other calls. We are now truly able to provide four levels of response to 911 calls where the need calls for police, fire, medical, or mental health. This is just one example of what when institutions come together and partner to deliver services. Lastly, when a person in my district calls 911 in dire need of medical assistance, is the EMS staff of North Memorial who answers that call. When a mother is due to give birth to their child, they will likely be at North Memorial. In my personal case, two of the most important days of my life were spent at North Memorial from the birth of my sons. Quality health care, whether in an emergency or planned, is personally important, often for those who we love the most. I would like to personally ask you to support North Memorial by helping them so they can continue to help all of us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the testimony. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, a really a big problem, and Senator Rest, uh, thanks for bringing the bill forward. Happy to be the second author, and thanks to so many of the staff who are here today. I just want to acknowledge their presence and thank them for their commitment uh, and to the North Memorial uh, family for their efforts. I did, I, I've been saying 64 percent. Sorry, it's 74 percent. I can't imagine. So they have lousy rates and increased demand. Um, but I just don't understand the bill. And it looks like a kind of a code. So Senator Russ, could you just tell me, like, where, do, where does the money come from in this voluntary program? Is this Hennepin County, or is there some other uh, fund that this voluntary program would be funded by? Um, Senator Rust. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Abler. The, um, uh, the source of the, of the state match is not in the bill specifically but we are looking toward local government support, certainly not state support. This is not a bill that is asking for uh, state dollars to, um, to initiate this uh, program of, uh, of directed payments. So we are, we are um, hopeful and I dare say confident that we will um, arrive at an arrangement with uh, uh, with the county, um, <clears throat> maybe other local governments that are um, within North's jurisdiction, if you will, um, to um, support the, um, the directed payments requirement of local, of local support that is then characterized for the match to get the, um, the federal dollars. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Well, I, I appreciate that, and Senator Rest, I appreciate your you know, reticence to use state money, but this is a really important resource. And so sometimes, if this, compared to some of the stuff we spent state money on last year, this would be like the highest priority, this and some of the greater Minnesota ambulance services, which are related to what you're doing. So anyway, I'm just cheering you on, and thank you for bringing the bill forward. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Abler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other member questions or comments? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Russ, for bringing this bill. You know, this whole morning, I think, is going to illustrate that our <laughs> we have a real problem. Our hospitals are in a lot of trouble. And North plays a very important and special role in our community, and it's imperative that it thrives. Um, so I'm proud to be a co-author on this bill. Uh, I salute you, Senator Russ, for finding a creative way to try to help the hospital maintain viability. I have a personal affection for North because I was born there yes. um, in very yes. dramatic fashion. My, my mother's and my lives were both saved that day. Um, but North Memorial cares for some of um, the people who need it the most in our community. So thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and thank you for bringing this bill forward, Senator Rust. 
Uh, Senator Rust, any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to share before we <clears throat> lay the bill over? Um, I just so much appreciate um, the um, willingness for you to, of you to hear this bill, and um, I especially, and I have thanked him um, privately, but want, want to thank um, Liam Moniker for the work that he has and the uh, creative way in which he has helped us um, structure this legislation. Uh, uh, means a lot to all of us, um, and that you know, and that that gratitude extends to all of our Senate Council and, and fiscal staff. They are they are just amazing. Um, thank you very much again. Well, thank you, um, and thank you, Senator Rest, for bringing this forward. I, I think we do need to look for look at all possibilities um, in trying to address this really challenging and really um, important issue. Um, it's clear that this is an important um, provider network and um, has a great impact on our state. So um, I will lay the bill over today and then we will continue to work to see what we can do this session. So um, Senate File 3838 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, next, we have Senate File 3819, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Madam Chair. We were just sharing hospital stories here of North Memorial and Golden Valley. And I was born at Hibbing Hospital. We, we all have hospital experiences, right? Yes, <laughs> that's true. Well, welcome to our committee, and um, you have a bill related to hospital construction. And, surprise, um, surprise. Yeah. yeah. Um, please proceed and Thank you. present your bill. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Members, Senate Fall 3819 is authorizing legislation to relocate 26 long-term care, long-term acute care hospital beds in Minnesota from Golden Valley to St. Paul. The request has been made by Regency Hospital. Regency Hospital is a subsidiary of Select Medical, which is a national hospital provider of critical illness recovery services. Regency Hospital has been providing long-term acute care services at its Golden Valley location since 2001. They are currently licensed for 92 long-term care acute hospital beds, and they currently operate 66 of those 92. So they're requesting to just relocate, not increase, but relocate 26 of these beds from their current location in Golden Valley to Regions Hospital in St. Paul. This is not an expansion of beds, but simply a relocation. The intention of the relocation is to better pr provide better access for patients in the Ramsey County East Metro area needing LTAC services for which there is a substantial shortage. Regency Hospital is one of just two long-term acute care hospitals in Minnesota. LTAC's approach, I hope I said that right, L-T-A-C-H, provides specialized inpatient acute care for patients recovering from catastrophic critical illness, including cardiac and heart failure, infectious disease treatment, neurological and post-trauma care, and wound care. This arrangement could best be described as a hospital within a hospital, and Regents has identified space that can accommodate these beds and will be built out over the course of the next two years, and Regents has supplied a support letter to uh, the committee. Regency Hospital has complied with the requirements under state statute for receiving an exception from the hospital construction moratorium thus far by submitting and completing the public interest review application to the Minnesota Department of Health and participating in a December 6th public hearing on the proposal. MDH is currently reviewing the public interest review application from Regency and we're optimistic they will find this proposal to be in the public's interest. We hope MDH's determination is issued prior to the completion of session and the language found in Senate File 3819 can be passed into law. Um, I have with me Mr. Sean Stricker, Stryker? Stricker. Stricker, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Regency Hospital to make a few comments. Uh, thank you, Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Stricker, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for having me today. My name is Sean Stricker. I'm the CEO for the um, Regency Hospital that's located in Golden Valley. Um, I want to thank uh, Senator pa Pappas for uh, authoring the bill and helping out here. So, um, so basically, Regency Hospital has been a fixture in our community for around 25 years. Um, 
We operate in the Golden Valley market, kind of that Minneapolis side. Uh, we provide a continuation of acute care for a special group of patients. Uh, these patients are patients that are lingering in ICU. Uh, they spend, uh, they're very sick patients. Uh, they've had a new trauma in their life. Uh, they have, they've had uh, a new baseline that they're gonna be facing. And uh, these patients have nowhere to go in the continuum because their needs, their clinical needs are, are still very high. Um, and, uh, and that's a need in the continuum that Regency Hospital um, um, meets. Um, our patients are at a level where, where some of the, the main rules to be in, in one of our hospitals is that 100% of our patients have had at least a four day stay in an IC, ICU setting before they meet uh, criteria to be at Regency. Um, Regency is staffed around the clock uh, with internal medicine physicians. Uh, they're there every single day taking care of the patient's need. Uh, we also have a very high emphasis in pulmonary, uh, infectious diseases, wound care. Um, the University of Minnesota supplies our wound care needs. Uh, we have physicians that, we, we have about 100 physicians that round on our patients, again, to meet their needs. Um, we have 100% RNs, uh, so we don't have any LPNs or med techs or that sort of thing. Every patient is seen uh, with a very high acuity uh, by an uh, RN team. Uh, we also have a very robust uh, respiratory therapy rehab and pharmacy department to meet, again, meet the patient's need. Um, typical needs for our patients are pulmonary management, severe, severe wound care, traumatic, traumatic brain, brain injury, uh, patients that are on critical drips and requiring high level of uh, nutrition, uh, hemodialysis, among others. It's kind of like there's an old saying, you don't know about Regency unless you need Regency. Um, again, we are 92 bed, we're licensed for 92 beds, have been licensed for for quite a long time. Um, we're only operating 66 beds. At one time, at one point in time, we were operating 92, but we deserted some of the beds. Well, we didn't necessarily decertify, but we went down in the bed count uh, simply to make all our rooms private. Uh, over the pandemic, and certainly a little bit before the pandemic, uh, we found that the need has has really increased. And um, we, wanted, we want to operate those 92 beds. Uh, about three years ago, uh, we did go through the state and got MDH approval to put the beds on the campus um, at, region, at Golden Valley. Uh, but quite frankly, it doesn't make sense because a lot of our patients are coming from Ramsey County, Eastern Minnesota, and Western Wisconsin. And it, it truly is a hardship. Our patients on average are in our hospital for about 30 days. And it's truly a hardship for families and patients to um, um, and physicians to follow their patients over to Regency. Um, we receive about 200, about 180 to 200 referrals a month, and we're taking in 55 to 60 patients. So again, there's that unkept need. Um, it's pretty interesting here in the North Memorial folks. Uh, a lot of these patients are stuck in the ICU setting because they can't go to rehab hospital. They cannot go to transitional care units because their needs are just way too high. And, and we're at about a 96% occupancy level, so we can't take additional patients. Uh, so it's a hardship on our short-term acute care hospitals throughout the state. Uh, we take patients from, from everywhere within the state. Um, we pretty much limit to the state now. We don't take patients from Iowa or, or Wisconsin anymore, but patients from Duluth, uh, St. Cloud, Mayo Clinic, Rochester uh, are our typical patient for Regency. Um, again, you know, it just makes sense for us to be, to have those 26 beds, not in Minneapolis, but in Ramsey County where the, where the patients are. So I appreciate the hearing and offer up any questions. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions for um, Senator Abler? Else can go first, no? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Pappas, um, and this might be for your, uh, your presenter here as well. Um, we have a hospital being built for mental health use right behind us. Um, is this going to have an impact on the need that they're going to have? I mean, I know the need is much greater than probably either facility can handle. Um, but my concern is that we're going to have a kind of a competing interest between the two hospital groups. And uh, do you see that being a problem uh, by moving from one county to the next? And uh, or is this just because the need is so great that we need to kind of address it with both teams? Yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mr. Certainly. Stricker, I, you just, I just need to acknowledge you and, as you speak. Oh, so, you, Mr. Stricker. 
Okay, thank you. Um, great question. Uh, we, in the healthcare system, we have, all have our continuum, and it's pretty clear. Uh, we take care of a four-day ICU patient. Uh, if our four-day four ICU patient does have mental health issues, uh, we'll take care of that clinical need and then move that patient over to that psych area. Uh, so, so they are a very important part of our continuum, without a doubt, and there would be no impact uh, in, in terms of discriminating what patient goes where. Senator Lewski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Pappas, thank you for finding some solutions to a very, very broad need, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, this realm is, is very underserved. So if we can move 20 beds to make this easier for this area, that would, that, that's all we need to do. I, I fully support what you're trying to do. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you. Thanks, Senator Pappas. I support your project. I, uh, welcome to being the 34th group uh, seeking a moratorium exception. <laughs> so, which raises the question, why do we even have one? Um, when we're in an industry now where some places are closing beds just because they don't choose to staff them, where companies like Alina just move entire departments out with barely public notice or, you know, Accenture closes Faustin and, like, it seems like, would someone come please serve our people? And I think that it's, we should really think about why we have a moratorium at all and God bless the department for sitting through it with Maple Grove Hospital. They spent a long time deciding who should do it and then we did it. <laughs> anyway, uh, and that was a contentious process. So good luck with your project. Thank you for serving the people. Regents has a great attitude toward helping. And uh, I think at some point, Madam Chair, we should let Regents continue to show their, I think, uh, Companies like that that have shown a high level of trust should be worthy of that trust. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, Senator Pappas. Just to clarify, it's confusing, but there's Regents Hospital, which is here in East Metro, and then there's Regency, which Mr. Strickland represents, which is a different hospital, and it's just for acute care patients. It's very similar names, yeah. yeah. Madam Chair, was Anne, was um, Anna, Anna, never mind, but I still want uh, <laughs> to. Good, good luck for you. <laughs> um, Senator Abler, I, I think your your point. We I have thought too that you know looking at our public interest review process is something that we should do and and try and figure out if the process needs to change or you know what are the what are the goals what are we trying to achieve and are we achieving them? But um, at this point, we've we have the process in place. We're trying to utilize it as best we can, and um, in this case, the report isn't back yet, but we wanted to hear the bill and then, um, you know, we will um, consider, you know, the report findings when they come out, which um, we believe will be uh, during session. So um, hopefully in, in a, just within the next few weeks. So um, any other member questions? No? Well, seeing none, Senator Pappas, any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to share? No, thank you for the hearing, Madam Chair. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your testimony. It, it seems like a, a unique um, situation. And uh, with that, we will lay, um, Senate file 3819 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, Senator Housley, Senate file 3674. Welcome to our committee, and um, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, thank you for hearing Senate File 3674 today. It's a pivotal bill to enhance our health care infrastructure's flexibility and responsiveness, particularly for smaller hospitals that are the backbone of health care delivery in many of our communities. This legislation proposes a straightforward yet vital change it allows hospitals with up to 130 bed licenses to transfer up to 100 of those licenses to a replacement facility within a five mile radius, up from the current limit of 70. By supporting this bill, we are ensuring community hospitals have the flexibility to plan for the future and that our communities continue to have access to the critical health care services they depend on. I have the president of Lakeview Hospital here today to share more about why this bill is so important to Stillwater and the surrounding communities that they serve. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. 
My name is Brandi Lunenberg. I'm the president of Lakeview Hospital in Stillwater, Minnesota. I'm here today to express strong support for SF3674. It is a bill that's critical not only for the future of Lakeview Hospital, but for the well-being of our entire community in the eastern Twin Cities area. Lakeview Hospital is an integral part of our region's healthcare system, providing essential services to our community through an integrated clinic and hospital system, which includes the Stillwater Clinic and the Lakeview Health Foundation. Our mission is to improve health and well-being in partnership with our patients, families, and broader community. However, our ability to fulfill this mission is currently constrained by the physical limitations of our facility. Despite being licensed for 97 beds, we're only able to operate 68 due to the size and structure of our current building. That limitation significantly hampers our ability to meet the growing healthcare demands of our community. Our average daily census continues to rise. Our operating rooms and care facilities are increasingly strained for space. And the aging physical structure of our site, which was largely built in 1960, presents ongoing challenges that affect our patients every day. Moreover, our region is experiencing demographic shifts. The population age 65 and over in our geography is expected to grow by 20% over the next five years. This will inevitably continue to increase demand for complex and critical care services, which we do provide at Lakeview, and often require longer hospital stays and more intensive treatments. There's already a persistent local and regional demand for additional healthcare capacity and higher levels of care in the St. Croix Valley and the East Metro. To address the challenges I just spoke about, Lakeview wants to construct a new facility at a nearby location more suitable for a modern hospital. The bill is essential for this project as it allows us to maintain our current 97 bed license in this new location. To be clear, we're not seeking any additional increase in current license bed capacity, nor does this bill allow for adding new licenses without first going through the established public interest review process. It's simply allowing us to fully relocate our existing license to our new facility, which is only three miles away in our local community. It'll help us meet our community's growing needs, and it's also not specific just to Lakeview. It will provide flexibility for other hospitals of 130 beds or less to relocate within five miles that 100 beds that we just spoke about. So in conclusion, I ask that you support SF36074. By doing so, you'll be supporting not just Lakeview, but will help us ensure residents across the state of Minnesota have access to essential health care services they depend on in our local community and now in the future. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the, the question really is that the dialogue that started 15 minutes ago, and, and I'm I'm glad to see that there's a, a connection to looking at the moratorium conversation and remembering uh, Senator um, Senjum in setting up these regional aspects. And he talked about the need. I mean, we could probably do a 400 bed facility. The need is that great, right? But there's something that, that would cause me to, to ask this question, um, Madam Chair. If you're having the, the conversations with the other body, there's a piece of hospital acute care that doesn't have to follow the 245D rules of positive supports. And, and as we look at expanding, are, where are those conversations happening? And I guess the question goes to the good senator from the Aspen of Minnesota, Stillwater. Um, is, is that conversation happening jointly? I mean, what you started 10 years ago, is this stuff happening jointly? Are we having a conversation with the other entities involved in the acute care of people that have, uh, that live with some mental health or substance use? Uh, Senator Housley. Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman, are we having the conversation with the other body about this? Is that what your question is? I, Madam, Chair, I, Madam Chair, I love it. Uh, both, the whole big conversation, because one of the things that, that was disheartening for me is that, that we were forcing because of the issue of decompression, right? So there's a, 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 young, a young individual who was serving, um, a, was staying at a, at a hospital, and, and that person under a 245D world and or under education world, there's a positive supports piece in there, right? But, but because they don't have to, hospitals do not have to follow the positive supports piece, and if you want to know what that is, it's, it has to deal with restraining, 
cuffing, things like that that were happening within that world. And, and as we're expanding this, where's that conversation within those other entities that are also in this world of, of the unique and individualized needs of somebody that lives with mental health to assure that, that their rights are not, you know, are being looked at. And so both the conversation globally, which of course we did when we were talking long-term care, I believe it was in this room, um, and, and, and also then with, uh, with the other body, uh, are, are those conversations happening? Senator Hosley. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Hoffman. I'm sure they are happening. I haven't been privy to them because I, I'm not sitting even on HHS committee. Maybe next biennium I could be on this committee and facilitate those conversations. But I'm absolutely sure they are happening with all of those stakeholders. But maybe um, Ms. Lindenborg would want to answer that. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you. As we look at this going forward, I, it, it almost, it's great that there's a response, but it, to me, I don't want it to be, you know, one exception, another exception, another exception without having a systemic conversation with, with both the, the departments and, and the folks that are involved in this process. And, and that's just my, my opinion on that matter. And I just, I, you're probably already having that knowing you. So um, I'm just saying that, that I, I think maybe both our committees need to be involved in some kind of conversation on that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any other member questions or comments? Senator Abler? Well, just back to the point, and I don't know if I, I think Senator Hoffman, I think that this program has come to an end. Uh, this, this modifies a, a moratorium exception number 10. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, this is a, a little bit, it's slightly different than the other. Um, it modifies one of the current exceptions and um, it's a general exception that was put in place and so um, it hasn't required or hasn't meant that um, the Lakeview Hospital has gone through that public interest review application process um, but I think we're we're trying to assess the the impact of of this change um, it does seem like um, this particular case where you are trying to build a new facility and you want to retain the, the capacity that you have, uh, the number of bed you ha beds you have, um, this small change uh, will accommodate your transfer. Um, if there were a situation that was very similar, having a hospital wanting to build another one within five miles, <laughs> it's, you know, it's very, very specific. Um, as long as it's not um, increasing the number of beds beyond what they currently have. Um, this, to me, um, it seems like it makes logical sense. Um, and I appreciate the handout with all the details about, um, you know, what you're trying to continue and, and be able to provide to the communities in that area. So um, any other member questions or comments? Um, Senator Housley, any final comments before we lay your bill over? Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair and Committee, for taking the time to hear this bill. It's very important to our community, so thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for testifying. Uh, Senate File uh, 3674 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, next, we have Senate File 4833, Senator Sieberger. Welcome to the committee, and please... Uh, Proceed. I think you have a uh, an amendment. Would you like to um, let's see the A two amendment? Would you like to adopt that as an author's amendment? Yes, please, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Mann moves the A two amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Please go ahead and pre present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I am pleased to be here on uh, Senate File 4833, which does a couple of things to um, uh, assist folks in gathering medical records in connection with uh, litigation and Social Security appeals. The first part of the uh, bill here, which is in the um, A2 amendment, brings the cost of medical records under control. 
In my practice as a, uh, an attorney, I routinely request medical records as a part of the cases that I defend. Uh, the plaintiff's counsel on the other side do the same thing. This statute has not been amended or updated since we switched to electronic copies. So what it, we have been doing is paying on a per page basis for medical records um, when we receive them as electronic copies. So I've been practicing law for 28 years. Back when I first started, um, those were the paper record days. And I remember going to records departments and leafing through paper files and putting paper clips on them. And um, then they would have to pull them and photocopy them. And it was a labor intensive process that used ink and paper and all of that stuff. Um, and that's why charges were based on a per page basis. Now I receive all the medical records electronically, usually through a portal, and it's a matter of a couple of keystrokes to get me what I need, and I'm still paying on a per page basis, as are all the other practitioners and folks. So this just brings it in line, um, recognizing that uh, the majority of records are delivered electronically, and instead of paying a dollar per page, you know, when I get 3,000 pages of records, it's a $3,000 bill or more for just electronic records delivered through a portal. This will uh, control those costs and bring it down to a reasonable fee. Um, that's the first part of the bill. For practitioners that still use paper records, and I'm looking at my chiropractors on the board here, it still does have a um, per page. <laughs> well, because we still receive paper records from some practitioners. Um, so it still does have a per page uh, copying charge for that and a $10 retrieval fee so that it is equitable for those folks that are still providing records in a paper format. Um, the, the second part of the bill um, assists those folks who are requesting medical records for their Social Security appeals. And there's a... Um, a letter along with this that kind of outlines the process and the frustrations that folks have been dealing with when they're attempting to get medical records um, in Social Security uh, disability benefits proceedings. And this is meant to streamline that process, assist those folks so they don't spend quite so much time and frustration gathering the records that they need for these important proceedings. I do have, let's see, I believe one testifier. And I'm happy to turn um, things over to that person. Thank you. Um, I have Chuck Slain. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson and committee members. My name is Chuck Slain. I am the immediate past president of the uh, Minnesota Association for Justice. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm also an owner of the law firm TSR Injury Law, where we represent uh, people who have been uh, injured in crashes. And in that practice, we routinely order the medical records for the treatment that our clients obtain. And what I wanted to talk to you about today is my perspective in that about what is currently happening and what we have the opportunity to do better. Currently, right now, we're using an old system based on paper. And we're measuring and billing to obtain data based on pages. And pages is no longer an adequate way to measure what is received. And it leads to a lot of inequities. And I, as an example, I brought with me an invoice that I received when I ordered some records for a client of mine. And uh, she was hospitalized for a period of time, and there were 11,000 pages of records. And I received a bill for $18,580. So I called this uh, facility, which, which, by the way, was not the hospital. It's a company from out of state that is contracting with the hospital and making all of this money and taking the money away from our hospital systems. And I asked them, why is this so much? And how am I going to obtain the records? And they said, well, I'll push a button and give you access to our portal. And you will download the records. So I asked them, well, then why am I paying you $18,500? The answer was telling. Because Minnesota law allows us to do it. 
Now, the other interesting thing is on this bill for the charges, there's tier one, tier two, and tier three. They give discounts as you go up the ladder. This $18,500 bill never made it to the discounted rate. Again, I asked, why is that? Well, because Minnesota law allows us to do that. Now, can we do it better? Last week, I ordered records for a client of mine who was hospitalized at Gunderson Hospital in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We faxed the request to them, and an hour later, I received the same volume of records electronically at no cost. That's the way that Minnesota should do this as well. Since we are in an electronic age, we should set up a system that measures what is received electronically rather than by a page, which no longer exists in our world. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is interesting that, that uh, to hear eleven eighteen thousand five hundred dollars if if they if 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 we made it possible that the, the Records Retention Act that was done in Minnesota, there's um, actually identified pricing for scanning images. Why do I know that? Because I helped an organization 20 years ago get this going. Um, and if you look at 11,000 pieces of paper, that's 62 inches of paper, that's $4,000 um, in labor hours, that's 220 hours of prep time, that's $550 at 0 .05 cents per scanned image, right? And I don't know if that's two-sided or what, but I don't know how they gouge you at 18,500, but you know, if you're, the vendors that do work for the state of Minnesota have to follow the Records Retention Act. There's some Department of Admin has the pricing that's already there, right? I mean, it would be simply to say, follow what's in state guidelines on that kind of thing. But it's uh, unbelievable that somebody would get you at $18,500 for basically $5,600 worth of work. So. Uh, what's what's the disposition of this bill, Madam Chair? Um, Senator Hoffman, we're going to lay this bill over. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, members, any other questions? Senator Kupek. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Seberger. Nice to see you're wide awake after your long and arduous trip through judiciary last night. Uh, but thanks for bringing this forward. And it should not lose sight on who, who in the end will pay for that $18,000 bill. It is not. It's going to be... It's going to be the consumer and the client that that the regular average person that gets hit with this bill. So, uh, thanks for bringing this forward and, and cleaning this up. I appreciate it. Any other questions, comments, Senator Rudkey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I had a question. It was as I first looked at the bill, and it was kind of just more for curiosity when it talks about the Social Security part of this. What would be examples of what they would be retrieving or asking for. Senator Sieberger. Madam Chair, Senator Atke, these are medical records. So when you're going in to prove up a social security disability case, you have to uh, present as evidence medical records, your own medical records that show um, your claim disability or medical condition and uh, medical treatment and doctor's opinions and that kind of thing. So it's, it's your own personal medical records that you are requesting and then entering into a court, uh, a, a proceeding, a determination. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and that's kind of what I figured in the first part of it talked about, you know, about the personal side of things. Um, a little bit of a concern with the amendment is the fact we're bringing in the commercial side of things with lawsuits, et cetera, at the last minute without having people here that might have other opinions about this. So um, I, I have concerns with the way we're adding that at the last minute because, and I know there's challenges out there sitting under work comp council. We work on that a lot, making sure that there's fairness in it. Um, but I would like to have seen this be something where we could have a little bit more of a hearing on it um, so everybody gets a chance to come and uh, participate. But uh, uh, thank you. I guess that's all I've got for right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, just a comment. I mean, I think Senator Seberger, this was two different. It was there were two separate bills, and I don't know if that addresses, um, in particular, Senator Atkey's, um what he's talking about. But I know we decided that that made that they were so similar, are relating to such a similar area that it made sense to bring them together rather than have a hearing on each bill. I don't know, Senator Seberger, if you wanted to add, add any comments. That's correct, Madam Chair. Senator Redke, I had a bill dealing with the first part of Section 142-292, and uh, Senator Mann, I believe, had a bill dealing with the second part, the Social Security part. Um, we were kind of going along two different trajectories, parallel trajectories, and when I learned that um, we both were amending the same statute, figured it just made sense to bring them together into one bill. So my bill was out there talking about um, uh, revising the fees to be charged for copies of patient records and along with the other one having to do with Social Security records. It's been out there for a while. Haven't heard any um, objections from the big medical record companies. Um, Minnesota Association of Justice is supportive. I know that the Insurance Federation is supportive. All of us practitioners who do this work, um, I mean, Mr. Slane and I, we, we're two, two sides of the same coin. We're both requesting medical records. Um, we do this work. We're constrained by a system that still observes, like he said, that this is a per page deal. And in fact, in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held last year um, that can't charge paper copies when you're delivering electronic. That's why they're all free over there now. That's not going to last. But we're being preemptive here over in Minnesota. To, we're trying to recognize what we're really getting is, is electronic data um, and uh, setting a more reasonable fee for that. Thank you. Senator Rodkey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up to that comment, Nat I fully understood what your first bill was doing, and I see the two bills that have been combined. It's just that as we came, everybody came to here today for 4833, it was for personal purposes, you know, whether it's uh, an individual for their medical uh, records or somebody with a social security uh, request, you know, for additional backup. But bringing in the commercial side, this additional bill is what I was uh, bringing up just for clarification. and. I know this is going to move forward, but that's the part I wished we would have known about. I think we'd have some additional individuals here to uh, give us a different side to this story, but um, timing is everything, so thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and I wasn't going to get involved, but I remember this, uh, when he did the Social Security part, um, if you're here long enough, you see a lot of bills you worked on get changed, but um, it was controversial then, and the world hasn't ended. Uh, with regard to these individuals, and a lot of these people are doing a denial. This is actually the existing law. But it looks to me like you've tightened it up a little bit to make it more clear that they have a, you know, a legitimate need or something. So, um, And just on our side, we do have electronic records. We sometimes have a hard time uploading them uh, to the different portals. And, but um, I, you're on the right track, so I just wanted to point that out. That I, I think the part on the page two is uh, kind of current law just cleaned up, so, but, unless I'm wrong. Thanks. Um, thank you, Sen Senator Abel. Yeah, that, that was my understanding that it was kind of rearranging so that it was more easy to understand um, what, the requirement, what the requirements are. Um, Senator Seeper, any other final thoughts? No final thoughts, Madam Chair. Thank you for allowing me to bring this bill. Thank you. Um, so Senate File 4833, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in an in omnibus bill. Thank you. Uh, next we have on the agenda uh, Senate File 4238, Senator Mann. Welcome to the committee table and uh, please go ahead and present your bill. I, I do see that you have an A1 amendment. Would you like to move that? I do, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Mann moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Thank please you, Madam proceed. Chair. Members, so Senate File 4238 creates an alternative medical assistance hospital inpatient payment rate 
uh, for Gillette Children's, which is especially children's hospitals serving children with disabilities, rare diseases, and very complex medical conditions. Medicaid disproportionate share hospital payments, or DISH payments, are federal statutorily required payments intended to offset a hospital's uncompensated care costs. Gillette Children's is, of course, a DISH hospital. States are required to, uh, are required to conduct DISH audits retroactively. So this legislation will prevent Gillette from losing over $7.3 million in MA payments that they have already received for 2021 rate year. This alternative payment mechanism is not ongoing. It is only needed for one rate year because of a very unique situation with a very long-term inpatient stay. Um, a loss of over uh, of $7.3 million in payments in one year will be extremely disruptive for a 60-bed hospital that takes care of our most complex kids. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, I do have a testifier. Yes, uh, Pat Nolan, um, please come to the table. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Chair Wicklin, members of the committee, my name is Patrick Nolan. I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Gillette Children's. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and thank you, Senator Mann, for authoring this legislation. I want to briefly provide some additional background regarding the legislation. A 2017 CMS rule changed how hospital-specific DISH payment limits are calculated. The rule and related calculation would have reduced freestanding children's hospitals' DISH funding by millions of dollars each year. The CMS rule has since been changed by Congress, effective October 2021, to address this issue, but it remains in effect from 2017 to September of 2021. State legislation established in 2017, chief authored by Representative Schumacher and Senator Lori, had the intention of preventing Minnesota freestanding children's hospitals, including Gillette Children's, from losing millions of dollars under the CMS rule, establishing an alternative payment methodology. Because of a unique circumstance, this alternative payment methodology is unintentionally creating a situation where Gillette would need to repay $7.3 million of 2021 Medicaid funding due to how a single patient is being incorporated into that calculation. The single patient required ongoing hospital level care at Gillette Children's for over 20 years and had a separate payment methodology established in Minnesota rules. This patient's 2021 discharge from the hospital resulted in multiple years of payments being included in the current alternative payment calculation, causing the repayment issue. The language in 4238 creates a new alternative payment methodology for the situation where a patient has resided at Children's Hospital for over 20 years by effectively excluding that patient from the calculation. This would eliminate the need for Gillette to repay Medicaid payments already received. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions? It's a very complicated... Uh, <laughs> Very complicated um, set of circumstances, and I appreciate your your developing the, the bill to address that. Um, I don't see any. Oh, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Senator Mann. Um, I was I was uh, talked to, talked about at this in my office quite a bit, and uh, I think my only concern was that if I, I understand that it's a very specialized situation, there's one case that that this is probably going to address. Um, and with that, I was a little bit concerned of leaving it open-ended. And so I was kind of hoping to put a sunset date on there that which we would be able to find an end so that we don't have to worry about this loophole being there all the time. Um, but I know that maybe it's something that we've been talking about and kind of going from there. Does that make sense? Senator Mann. Makes sense. Okay. okay. We will, um, you, you can talk about it if you come up with... Um, any suggestions, um, let me know for a possible change. So, Thank you. Um, any other questions? Senator Mann, any final thoughts? No? Uh, well, thank you again. And Senate File 4238, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. And Senator Mann, you have also Senate File 4462. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate File 4462 is a really important bill that will provide timely updates to the medical assistance hospital fee-for-service reimbursement rate setting process. Specifically, it will transition the required inflation of hospitals' MA fee-for-service rates to a process that more accurately reflects the current patient care costs 
and it rebases critical access hospital MA fee for service rates to 100% of their actual care costs. In recent years, Minnesota hospitals uh, have, of all sizes have seen a rising cost to do business, like all other businesses, but the difference is that this is healthcare. We don't get to choose when we use it. And so because of these rising costs, we are seeing the erosion of the sustainability and accessibility of inpatient hospital care in Minnesota. I work in a rural hospital, and uh, we're literally next to a cornfield, and we have limited services available in our little hospital. In the last two years, we have been taking care of patients that should be hospitalized at higher levels of care. We take care of them in our little hospital when they should not be there, and when we run out of beds, which happens frequently, uh, we take care of them in our ER. And this is happening all over the state. People who should be hospitalized simply cannot be put in the right place. So the changes proposed in Senate File 4462 will help our hospitals face the extreme pressures that they are currently facing while taking care of the state's most vulnerable population. There are many steps that we need to take to decompress the ERs and provide more uh, hospital beds and appropriate level of care for patients. Um, and providing the appropriate compensation is absolutely and obviously one of these steps. With that, Madam Chair, I do have a testifier. Senator Mann, before we move to the um, testifiers, yeah. did you want to adopt the A1? I do, amendment? Madam Chair. It just uh, changes the date. Okay. So Sen uh, Senator Mann offers the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. And now um, your testifiers, um, please state your name for the record and, and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Danny Ackert with the Minnesota Hospital Association. I'm here in strong support of Senate File 4462. I want to thank Chair Wickland for carrying this bill last year and handing the baton to Senator Mann, who sprinted us to this point with this hearing today. So thank you, Senator Mann. Um, uh, Senate File 4462 and its provisions make timely updates to medical assistance, hospital inpatient fee for service reimbursement rates. Um, to, reiterate, to briefly reiterate what Senator Mann presented just a moment ago, the bill does two things. Uh, first, it adds two years of inflation to medical assistance, hospital fee for service, inpatient rates, and more accurately accounts for the actual real time patient care costs. This more comprehensively measures changes in hospital costs such as the unprecedented increases in labor and supply costs in recent years, and will more accurately adjust rates to reflect the totality of how hospitals are delivering patient care when the patient actually receives the care. For reference, due to COVID and other factors, current rates are based on 2019 costs. Additionally, the proposed inflationary adjustment in Senate File 4462 is commensurate with how the Department of Human Services adjusts other medical assistance reimbursement rates, such as those for federally qualified health centers and managed care organizations. We are grateful for the Department's technical assistance and partnership on this language. Second, Senate File 4462 rebases critical access hospital medical assistance fee for service rates to 100% of their actual patient care costs. Currently, critical access hospitals are grouped into three cost-based reimbursement tiers, 85%, 95%, and 100%. There are 29 critical access hospitals in the 85% tier, 23 in the 95% tier, and 18 in the 100% tier. This bill moves the combined 52 critical access hospitals in the 85th and 95th tier to the 100th, and in doing so, immediately provides desperately needed uh, financial support to Minnesota's rural network of essential emergency and acute care providers, the overwhelming majority of which currently have negative operating margins. Both provisions are timely needed because Minnesota's hospitals of all sizes continue to struggle with the unprecedented rise in all costs, as well as increasing patient acuity and complexity. All of this combined has begun to erode the sustainability and accessibility of inpatient hospital care that Minnesota's, Minnesotans rely on. And currently, medical assistance fee for service rates only covers, on average, 70% of actual patient care costs. Senate File 4462 and its proposed updates to the medical assistance fee for service rate, inpatient rate setting process will help Minnesota's, hospital, Minnesota's hospitals face the extreme pressures they are facing while serving Minnesota's uh, medical assistance fee for service population 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with that, I will turn to our next testifier, Mr. Rick Brewer. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. 
Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. I'm Rick Brewer. I'm the CEO at Community Memorial Hospital in Cloquet, where I've served for almost 25 years. We are an independent critical access hospital licensed for 25 beds. Each month, we deliver compassionate, personalized care to thousands of patients through our emergency department, our inpatient units, clinics, and various outpatient programs and services. Like many other hospitals in Minnesota, we had a negative operating margin last year. Our loss in 2023 was 6.8 million, or negative 10.6%. This forced us to make some difficult decisions. The hardest decision our board ever had to make was to close our nursing home in 2023. Our nursing home had always lost money, and the overall, overall organization subsidized it. But with losses growing in both the hospital and the nursing home, this was simply an unavoidable event. Healthcare has been in a desperate state since the pandemic. Unprecedented turnover created vacancies unlike anything we had seen before. Our employees are the engine that makes possible everything that we do. We are working hard to recruit back our workforce so we can fully serve our community, but wage inflation has hurt us badly. Our wage increases over the last year alone have averaged 6% and been as high as 12%. Hospitals aren't just hospitals. They are often the home for many other related health care services, from nursing homes to EMS to home health, along with clinics and other outpatient programs. We want to keep our hospital services local as much as possible. Patients do better when they can stay closer to home. Low reimbursement threatens the viability of many of these programs and services offered locally. We strongly support Senator Mann's bill, Senate File 4462, referred to as the hospital rebasing bill. Community Memorial has been historically one of the lowest paid hospitals in the entire state when it comes to medical assistance. So when payment tiers were created for critical access hospitals to update the rebasing process 10 years ago, we were thus put in that lowest 85% tier. And under that logic, we are forever trapped at the lowest payment tier among critical access hospitals. I was there 10 years ago when that was created. It was stated that was a bridge, a temporary solution, but here we are remaining in that lowest payment group. And the situation is no better for the larger hospitals across the state. Currently, fee-for-service medical assistance inpatient hospital rates are paid at 68.5% of 2019 base year costs for those non-critical access hospitals. Uh, again, 2019 is the current base year for hospital inpatient medical assistant rates. That's five years ago, and a lot has happened in supply costs and labor costs since then. This bill rebases rates to reflect changes in costs between the existing base year to the rate year, helping hospitals recoup more of their experience past inflation. With that additional reimbursement, we can continue to reinvest in our workforce. Thank you for considering this important legislation. Statewide, hospitals are now seeing close to 64% of our patients being enrolled in either Medicaid or, Medi or Medicare, with many of us higher than that. Hospitals need the government health care payers to get closer to the actual costs of providing care. Without this, access to care will be in jeopardy. Thank you for the time this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do you have any questions um, or comments? Sen Senator Abler. Madam Chair, wasn't rebasing in our bill last year? Um, Senator Abel, yes, we had it. We included uh, a very similar proposal. Right. Um, not exactly the same, I think, but very similar in our bill. And it was not, yeah, we didn't reach agreement with the other. Oh, well, well, thank you for that. I just wanted to commend the Senate again for standing up for legacy programming. Uh, we've heard nothing at this committee except the, the, the very programs that we're relying on uh, in the name of equity <laughs> for people who are in whatever category you want to call that are at risk to not get care. And, you know, uh, it's incredible to me and uh, I was disappointed that the governor and his budget didn't do anything about this matter as well, even though it was, I think it was in his budget last year. And so um, there are certain things that are absolutely essential 
that um, a hawk like me would spend money on. <laughs> it's a good year to be a hawk because we're going to go broke pretty soon. But this is something we have to do. We're trying to think of voluntary programs to squeeze money into the programs, and it's not working. And so, at the very least, I just totally support this bill. And I, uh, if there's any target whatsoever, this has got to be the highest priority. So, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. And thanks again for your leadership on this. I'm just thank, thank you. you for that. No, thank you. I, I thought it, it seemed like a very essential issue, and I really appreciate Senator Mann continuing to work on this because it is um, it's critical that we, we keep working to address this. Members, any other questions? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Mann. That is a good bill. I've got a question that's a little bit unrelated to the bill, but for our hospital administrator, you mentioned you closed a nursing home part of your operation. Um, without going into much detail, is would this come back with additional funding? And we, we all know the shortage of nursing homes and all of that across the state, too. So that was a cons piece that jumped out as a concern. Um, or are those people being taken care of elsewhere? But I was just wondering if, if this would help bring that back to life. Mr. Breyer. Breyer. Madam Chair, uh, thank you uh, for that question. I'm sure there are many other hearings, and, and we could talk all day about the state of nursing homes and nursing home funding. Um, that is a problem that we tried to solve for years and years and supported the, the million-dollar losses. And as our nursing home loss grew into a multi-million-dollar loss and overall hospital uh, operations faltered, we had to make that choice. The, the licenses have gone away, and so that would create a whole new process as well. And uh, I'm very proud of the work our folks and our partners in the region did at placing those residents where they are receiving care. So I would not anticipate reopening that. We are looking at other meaningful ways we can serve our community with that vacated space, but I, I think it's too late for that, and I hope it's not too late for other nursing homes across the state. But again, that's a... That is a big issue as well. Okay. Senator Atkin. No. Um, any other members, questions, comments? Um, Senator Mann, any final thoughts? Yeah, just um, to kind of reiterate how, how difficult it is to work in healthcare these days. Um, you know, I go to work every day and I think to myself, is this the day that someone's going to die under my care because I can't get them to where they need to be? I mean, that's reality for all of us every day. So th this is just an important step so we can pay people what they're worth. We can hire more people. We can stop closing nursing home or long-term care units and OB units, which are happening all over, um, with the ultimate goal, of course, of providing adequate, appropriate care. So thank you. Thank you very much. And so with that, um, Senate File 4462, as amended, uh, will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. And next we have Senator Morrison, Senate File 2885, and this relates to temporary funding for um, high acuity parent, or for um, hospital settings, so. And Senator Morrison, uh, you have an A1 amendment. Would you like to move your author's amendment? I would like to move the A1, Madam Chair. Members, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Thank you. And please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, thank you for hearing Senate file 2885 as amended. Uh, two thirds of Minnesota hospitals have negative operating margins. This is for a number of reasons, rising supply and labor costs, low reimbursements from the federal government and the state government, which don't cover the cost of care, as we just heard about from Dr. Mann, and from commercial payers as well, which have not kept their payments up with inflation. But one of the added challenges for hospitals right now is the inability to discharge patients once their acute care needs have all been met. Many people assume that a busy hospital with a lot of admitted patients means a hospital with a positive operating margin but that is actually very far from the truth. Many payers reimburse hospitals on a DRG, a Diagnostic Related Grouping Code, and this payment is for certain conditions and for a certain number of days. 
Hospitals are generally not paid for what are considered to be non-acute care services. Also, there are people who come to emergency departments who don't meet inpatient criteria, so they cannot be admitted. But it may not be safe or appropriate for them to be discharged. If the hospital can't find a safe community setting for many of these people, they simply begin boarding at the hospital because there is no other option. The numbers are pretty stunning. It's, you've heard them before, but they're worth repeating. In 2023, patients across the st state spent roughly 195,000 avoidable days in hospitals, waiting for the right level of care to become available. This includes close to 12,000 avoidable days for children alone. These avoidable days accrue due to significant delays waiting for patient transfers to nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, rehabilitation units, mental health treatment facilities, and state-operated treatment programs. Discharge delays are also consistently due to lengthy county and state administrative processes that, although necessary, urgently need improvements. Of the total avoidable days documented in 2023, 9,223 days were, were attributed to unnecessary emergency department care called boarding that filled some of the most critical care beds in the state with patients often stuck waiting for inpatient care or simply being brought to a hospital emergency department for the lack of any viable alternative. Overall, the avoidable days significantly increase waits for other patients, force some patients to find other care elsewhere with potentially life-threatening delays, and cost Minnesota hospitals and health systems an estimated $487 million in unpaid patient care in 2023. Senator Hoffman has a bill that starts to address some of the underlying reasons for these discharge challenges, like administrative processes for min choice assessments, medical assistance eligibility determinations, and community provider rate setting. All are good ideas, but po these possible solutions will take time, and our hospitals need this financial remedy now. Senate File 2885 calls for a $100 million allocation to help hospitals which is less than 25% of their actual losses for avoidable day costs from 2023. This allocation will help hospitals weather some of the financial difficulties they are facing. We need our hospitals to stay viable so they can keep providing the health care services that we all need. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, I have two testifiers, and I believe that Mary Krinke from uh, MHA is first. Yes. Um Please, um, I'm Mary Crinky and Jennifer DiCabellis, and uh, welcome to the committee. And Ms. Crinky, please yeah. uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Mary Crinky with the Minnesota Hospital Association. And thank you, Madam Chair, for having this hearing today and from hearing from hospitals across the state. We really appreciate this opportunity today and, and the breadth of the bills that you've heard. I, I, she stole all my good lines, so um, I just have a couple comments that, that I want to make. Um, hospitals right now are caring for hundreds of people that don't need to be there, and, and that's just really a strange phenomenon that we've never had before, that we have people in the hospital just waiting to be discharged, and they generally fall into two categories of patients, and, and I do want to share that. The first category are individuals who have been admitted to the hospital and all of their acute care needs have been met and they're waiting to be discharged either to a nursing home or home care or assisted living and they just can't find a spot. And, and then the second category are mostly individuals with mental health needs who come into the emergency room and sometimes they don't meet admission criteria for being admitted or the hospital doesn't have an inpatient mental health unit. And this is what Senator Morrison referred to, this is boarding. And, and frequently these are young people, kids, and we just don't have anything in the community where these children can be safely sent. And, and I'll be honest, they are languishing. They're not getting better. They just live at the hospital. It's a terrible situation. And I'm going to turn it over here to one of our members here, Jennifer D. Kabilis. She's the president and CEO at Hennepin County Medical Center. And obviously, they're a large hospital that deals with this every day. But I, I want to be clear, this is happening in every single hospital across Minnesota. So even our smallest of small hospitals are boarding patients now that really need to be in a different setting. And it is costing our hospitals 
lots and lots of money because frequently there is zero payment associated with this care. I, I just want to say that this bill is entirely scalable. Uh, obviously, more money is better than less money, but it can, it, any little bit here will help. And DHS has implemented this last year. It's relatively easy for them to do. It has low administrative costs, and we're appreciative of any support you can provide. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. DeCabellis, if please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee Members. Jennifer DeCabellis, I'm the CEO for Hennepin Healthcare, um, also known as HCMC, for our, our hospital facility. And I'm here to testify in support of the reimbursement for hospitals for avoidable, uh, non-acute patient days. And what I really want to do today is not talk as much numbers and money, but to put a face in front of you for what we're seeing. As you all well know, HCMC is a safety net hospital caring for patients with complex care needs, those with co-occurring mental illness, with substance use disorders, with cognitive needs, with physical needs. Nearly half of our patients are on Medicaid, and we proudly care for this patient population who often face the biggest barriers to placement. I know all of you receive our weekly hospital system status updates, so you know our specific discharge numbers and the challenges we face. As Ms. Krinke mentioned, this is not unique to Hennepin Healthcare, however, it is impacting every single hospital. And the most common reason for delays are the lack of the community placement options or significant administrative burden delaying discharge that I know Senator Hoffman is also working on some solutions for. As mentioned, I'd like to share a couple of people stories, real stories that are currently uh, in our walls. One individual has been with us over 700 days, has had several placements pending. They've fallen through, and they've fallen through repeatedly due to policies related to age limitations in customized living, related to guardianship issues, and related to funding, administrative barriers that is keeping this individual in a hospital bed over 700 days. The biggest concern we have is we've seen this length of stay impact the quality of life. He is decompensating in our walls. As healthcare providers, our providers take an oath to do no harm. And this is an example of an individual, to no fault of his own, that we are doing harm because he's at the wrong level of care. We as a state are doing harm. Another patient, many of you have heard me talk about with a traumatic brain injury, waiting to go to St. Peter. He has assaulted our staff over 120 times. These aren't small assaults. We visit our team members when they're in our own emergency department. 120 times. I've met with him, he's a great guy. To no fault of his own, his brain isn't working, and we are not a safe environment for him. He's been with us over 620 days. He's living there without fresh air, without exercise, without an ability to move around the community like all of us have the luxury of doing. This is harming him, and every day I need to reassure that team we're doing something to get them the help so they also are safe to continue to provide care to other patients. Last winter, we moved one patient who was in our health system for nine months without medical necessity, an elderly woman with dementia, into a customized living home. HCMC, with no funding, we're in the red, paid $500 a day for culturally appropriate customized living in the community, saving the state nearly $500,000 at our expense. We refused to let her die and spend her last days in a hospital bed. We wanted her to have dignity and care. These types of scenarios are playing out in hospitals across the state every single day. Many of our youth boarding in our hospital with mental health issues are medically cleared to discharge shortly after their admission, but they stay for weeks on a medical unit because they don't have the services they need in the community. 
Discharge delays mean that beds needed for trauma patients at your largest level one trauma, the only hospital serving adults and pediatrics for level one care. At one point in 2023, we turned away 56% of the requests coming into a trauma hospital because we didn't have the medical beds available. Currently, we're seeing less requests for our beds and other hospitals like critical access hospitals you heard from earlier today holding that level of care, a level of care they're not comfortable providing, but because they can't get in our door. Hospitals are not a place to live. This issue is about humanity of patient care and it requires urgent legislative attention. Payments to hospitals for these avoidable days are not a final solution but it will help stabilize hospitals during the crisis we find ourselves in right now. And I'll give you a couple of quick numbers. Our hospital during the peaks of COVID was seeing about 400 people in our patient beds. We're currently running 430, 435. That's 35 additional beds we've brought online to meet the demand. And we're still not able to take those transfers. That 35 number is about the same number of people that we have that are discharge ready and can't get out of our doors. It means we've had to find the funding for, to staff 35 more beds with nurses, with healthcare assistants, with mental health workers, with facilities and housekeeping, without payment. I don't know of anyone else who would be able to do this care for free. We do it because we care for our patients, and our request here today is to please make sure it is not at the cost of other services having to be shut down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members, any questions? I don't see any questions. Um, let's thank you for helping us understand not only the, you know, the financials of it, but also you know, what it means for, for people in our state. So. Um, Senator Morrison, any other final thoughts? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members, for considering this urgent need. I think uh, I think the CEO of Hennepin, been, um, as Dee Cabela said it very well, and illustrating with specific patient examples uh, what a dire moment this is for our hospitals and by extension for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the bill forward. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair, I just maybe go ahead and, and make your do what you're going to do next. But I just I'm looking at the themes of all these, the unique needs we have as this committee, and, and this is just heart wrenching. Still is from the day. And Jennifer, thank you. You're spot on 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 what you're saying. It's like get people out. I mean, get people walking. Get the supports there. Um, I'm looking at that, that there's no hearing scheduled for these bills. There's no known, you know, what, what's the other body doing? I mean, are they, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to be tongue-in-cheek on this, but once again, you're bringing real issues forward, and um, what can we do to, to get the spotlight on the House that doesn't seem to be wanting to do anything when it comes to this? Um, well, Senator Hoffman, I guess I, we, neither of us control the other's agenda, and un, unfortunately, but I mean, we're, um, you're right, you know, you're we're right. hoping that by highlighting these areas that have, you know, really huge needs in terms of what the level of funding is that's required to, to meet those needs, you're right. um, that we, we have a better understanding in, in our own you know, our own body, what uh, we would see as priorities to, to try and take steps if we can this session. Um, I think it also means that we are better prepared and more thoughtful about, you know, what we might be able to do in, an, in the next budget session. And so we need to continue to understand, you know, what are the mechanisms that we can. I'm, I'm grateful for your leadership, oh, Madam well, Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, with that, um, Senate file. 2885, as amended, will be laid over for a possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And last on the agenda, we have Senate File 4602 and Senator Bolden. This bill uh, is a clone of Senator Bolden's bill, and um, Senator Bolden has a... Um, uh, delete everything amendment and I 
it's not it's new to our committee but it has been heard in commerce and I was hoping that you'd, you'd be able to go through the amendment and let us know you know what are the provisions that you're including um, that we're taking uh, a look at today so uh, please proceed with your presentation thank you madam chair and, com and committee members so yes um, the bill that is before us is the clone as was mentioned uh, of Senate file 4065 which is the uh, Minnesota debt fairness act uh, which has been heard in the Commerce Committee the a1 amendment that is before you is a DE amendment that um, is specific to the portions of that broader bill that is within the jurisdiction of HHS. Um, so Madam Chair, if it is okay with you, I would like to um, do a sort of an overview and then I do have um, uh, testifiers including uh, um, Assistant Attorney General uh, Bennett Hertz who can walk through the uh, amendment as well if that's okay. That sounds good, yes, please proceed. Thank you. Healthcare is a human right and everyone deserves to be able to afford their life. But too many, Ameri too many Minnesotans are saddled with crushing medical debt, which is why I'm really grateful to share the provisions of the Debt Fairness Act that are under the HHS juris jurisdiction with you this morning. As you can see from the letters in your packets and some of the stories that we will hear today, medical debt is a weight far too many Minnesotans carry with them every day. We also know that medical debt, consumer debt, and financial distress are strongly connected. A recent study by the Peterson Center on Healthcare found that people with medical debt are more apt to have no rainy day fund, be overdrawn, have credit card debt, use predatory payday loans, and be contacted by debt collection. Additionally, there are direct health implications related to medical debt. Again, from the Peterson study, 59% of people with medical debt have chosen not to get care due to cost. This is just 17% of people with no medical debt. And it's worth noting that these impacts are more prominent in communities of color. I see the effects of this as I care for patients in the hospital, so often in times when patients and families should be focused on care, rest, and healing, they can't because the worry, fear, and anxiety about their looming medical debt is overwhelming. Medical debt is not like taking out a car or small business loan. It's not something that one expects or plans for an accident, illness, or diagnosis, which could happen to any one of us, can lead to unexpected costs with far-reaching effects. With this bill, we are looking to add some fairness into that system. Some fairness that will allow some breathing room for patients and families to be able to pay their medical debt. At times right now, um, because of the unfairness in the system, patients are pushed into more poverty and, and bankruptcy to a point where they are not able to pay their debt. So we're looking to add some, some fairness into the system. I want to note many conversations we've had with stakeholders on all sides of this issue. Uh, and I want to thank stakeholders for being at the table in good faith. We have made significant changes to the bill um, from its introduction uh, to now based on those conversations, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I would like to turn it over to Assistant uh, Attorney General Bennett Hertz to walk through the amendment and then uh, turn to testimony. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Hertz. Please join us at the table. Good morning. And please uh, go ahead and state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wickland. My name is Bennett Hartz. I am Assistant Attorney General in Consumer Protection. The Attorney General's Office appears here today to support Senate File 4602, the medical provisions of the Minnesota Debt Fairness Act, which would help Minnesotans pay back their medical debts fairly and affordably without falling into poverty, bankruptcy, and future health crises in the process. The bill's current language reflects the author's and the Attorney General's productive and ongoing conversations with stakeholders on all sides of this bill, including advocates for patients and providers, creditors and debtors, and state agencies. Now, I'm here because Senator Bolden has asked me to give you an overview of the bill's provisions. So first, the bill would give patients protection against the worst hardships of medical debt. For example, it would allow patients to seek medically necessary care, regardless of whether they have outstanding medical debt. It would also follow numerous other states and likely soon the 
Consumer Financial Protection Bureau at the federal level in prohibiting the reporting of medical debt to the credit bureaus. It would also eliminate the statute that penalizes married couples by making them automatically liable for each other's medical debts, um, a law that makes Minnesota an extreme outlier among states and creates deeply difficult and unfair uh, situations like couples uh, choosing to get otherwise unwanted divorces to avoid financial hardship and widows and widowers being forced to file for an unexpected bankruptcy upon the death of their spouse because of their spouse's medical debts. This bill would also require medical providers to make their collection practices available to the public and would enhance the ability for patients to challenge medical bills which they believe were wrongly coded by their provider or their insurance company. Now, second, the bill creates some basic consumer rights for patients with medical debt. For example, it allows patients who successfully defend against a wrongful lawsuit for medical debt, for debt that they do not owe, to request payment of their costs and attorney's fees uh, incurred in defending against that claim. It also includes protections against uh, using false and misleading statements to collect medical debt or using threats of illegal activity to compel payment of medical debt. Now, both the patients themselves and the Attorney General's office would have the ability to enforce these rights, with patients having the ability to seek their damages as well as their costs and fees if successful. So overall, this bill seeks to make the medical debt collection process fair for everyone so that this challenging but very important function of the medical system can operate without letting patients and working families fall into health crises and poverty and instead allow them to pay back their medical debts affordably and with dignity. So for those reasons, the Attorney General's office supports passage of Senate File 4602. Thank you all for your time and your attention to this critical bill. Thank you. Um, next I have Walt Myers. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee, and please state your name. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, my name is Walt Myers. I'm from Lakeville. I'm a lifelong resident of Minnesota and a father of, father of three. I'm an Army veteran, a cancer survivor, and I'm a volunteer at Cancer Legal Care. My wife Sue battled breast cancer for 23 and a half years. In January of 2019, we were informed by her oncologist that Sue's cancer had metastasized to her liver, and while there were treatment options available, she didn't expect any of them to do much good. As Sue immediately told her doctor that she was done. She didn't want any more chemotherapy. So after 23 and a half years, my wife became a hospice patient. It was her wish to stay in our home for as long as possible. And the hospital put us in contact with a, an in-home hospice team that provided Sue with exceptional care for the last two months of her life. During that time, I uh, started to receive uh, explanation of benefits or EOBs from the insurance company. The EOBs were usually many pages long, explaining the services that had been provided and at first I tried to reconcile them, but I couldn't. It was just, it was just overwhelming for me. <clears throat> On the first page of e, uh, each EOB was printed, this is not a bill. So I just ended up making a stack of them on my desk. Shortly after Sue's passing, the EOBs turned into actual bills, sometimes for thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. And I couldn't understand what was happening because the charges far exceeded my pl what my plan said I should owe. I was uh, confronted what was becoming a significant medical debt that I didn't understand and had no idea what to do about. At first, I tried dealing with the bills myself, calling with people, or calling people who I thought might be able to help me. Most of them were sympathetic, but no one really knew what uh, seemed to know what to do. Fortunately, I, I somehow remembered a comment a social worker made to us during one of uh, Sue's treatments at the ca cancer center. And she told us that if you ever need legal help, there's this organization called Cancer Legal Care that provides free legal services to cancer patients. At the time, um, I remembered thinking to myself, well, why would I ever need something like that? 
So I called them and explained what was happening, and they put me in contact with their insurance expert. And with the help of my former employer, we found a way to contest the bills. After a few stressful weeks of waiting, we got a response back from the insurance company. The entire amount had been forgiven, all of it. $135,000 of surprise out-of-network medical debt was gone. I can only imagine what my life would be like now if I hadn't remembered that seemingly random comment made by the social worker that day. I, I might still be making monthly payments on a six-figure medical debt that I actually didn't know. So I suppose no one would be surprised if I said I wholeheartedly support the effort to ban the transfer of medical debt to a patient's spouse. And I would respectfully encourage the members of the committee to do the same. The elimination of Sue's medical debt was life-changing for me. And eliminating spousal debt could have an equally life-changing effect on many for four many Minnesotans. Please pass this bill and make it a reality in Minnesota. I believe it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now I have Mary Crinky. Um, welcome. Please again state your name for the record and begin. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair and members, my name is Mary Crinky and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Um, we have been meeting frequently with Senator Bolden and the House author, Representative Ryer, trying to scope a few of the provisions in the bill. And the discussions, as Senator Bolden said, they've been respectful and productive and we're very grateful that they've taken so much time to meet with the providers and and we, we meet like every Monday and Friday at 8 a.m., so, so they've been ongoing discussions. Um, we're hoping that legislators can find the right balance with this bill to recognize that there are many low-income individuals who can't afford their health care, and at the same time recognize that nonprofit hospitals do have to get bills paid, and, and we've got to keep our doors open. I, I want to point out just a couple statistics that I think add some context. Um, Minnesota, according to the Commonwealth Fund, has the lowest amount of medical debt in the country per population, which is really great. We're at 2.4 percent compared to the worst state in the country of West Virginia at 24 percent. So while this is still a problem, and I'm not trying to make light of it, it's, it's not a problem that is as big as it is in other states. I also want to note that we recognize that no one really chooses to have medical debt. Bad things happen, um, car accidents, heart attacks, etc. And so these individuals can't pay their medical bills, and this is a growing problem because of uh, so many people having high deductible health plans. I would like to make a plug for a bill of Senator Mann's that's not under consideration, I don't think, this year. But this is an issue that we would like to come back and visit. It's Senate File 4012 that would shift some of the responsibility of collecting co-pays and deductibles for emergency rooms and for ambulance services to the health plans. Right now, hospitals and healthcare providers are 100% on the hook for trying to track down those co-pays and deductibles, and frequently individuals uh, can't pay. We are still looking at a couple of the provisions of the bill, and, and we heard about spousal medical debt. Uh, this is an issue that we certainly don't want to put widows and widowers in bankruptcy, but maybe this is something that could have some type of income threshold. The other language in the bill that we're still a little concerned about is the issue regarding medical coding mistakes. We clearly don't want anyone to pay a medical bill if it's been falsely coded, but we don't want this to be a green light for the health plans to question everything and say that this has been uh, coded incorrectly. We're afraid that this could add to our prior authorization challenges that we already have. So this bill has been changed, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, in closing, I just want to say that hospitals and health systems no longer do credit course credit company score reporting, that as being a nonprofit, we no longer do that. And the hospitals have agreed and think it's the right policy to say that we're no longer going to deny care in our clinics if someone has an outstanding medical bill. So as nonprofits, we recognize that as part of our responsibility. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I'd heard a comment just recently that there, 
they hope to continue working and I would sure hope that that's the case because um, it's hard to write a bill that's fair to all and this bill isn't fair to all um, we do have people that have these huge debts out of no fault of their own um, health issues and it was as it was mentioned accidents etc but we do have people that have the means to pay and elect not to and we shouldn't be letting them off the hook but it, again how do you write legislation that does that and then there is also the, the option or the circumstance where when we talked about the transfer to a spouse where yes one spouse suffers through expensive end of, end of life treatment but they've also have large life insurance policies in place that they planned years prior, but they're there for those types of reasons too. Um, so there's a there's both sides to this, and uh, you know as it sits, I'm not a fan of it, but I would hope that the conversations can continue so that we can work through these issues. So in the end, we've got something that is a handout or a helping hand to those that really have a, a problem and are getting hit with this debt and somehow we can uh, help some of the others manage through their system and pay for the debts that they've incurred, um, whether it's through um, the current monies that they have or the election to not have insurance. And it's not because they can't afford it, they just don't believe in it. And now all of a sudden we're, we're subsidizing that mentality. So um, I, I wish you well and uh, hope that this uh, conversation continues, so thank you. Senator Bolin, do you want? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the comments. I, I would just uh, reiterate and, and thank the stakeholders. A lot of work has gone into this bill to make it just that fair. And that really is what we're trying to do is inject some fairness into the system, which right now just is not. Um, and I would push back a little bit on the notion that there's a lot of people running around just um, consuming a bunch of medical care and, and just saying, I, I don't want to pay my bill. I don't think that's a, a thing that happens much, if ever. People are um, getting medical care because they need it. We, you know, I cannot tell you the number of uh, conversations I've had with people who know I've been working on this bill, or even people who don't, it just comes up organically, um, you know, who um, talk about the, the, the burden, the worry, the, the devastation that comes with the medical debt that they've incurred um, through care that they need. Um, and people want to pay their bills, it's it's overwhelming and people often just can't. And so looking to inject some fairness into the system. Um, and you mentioned um, a handout. We're not looking for a handout. We're really just looking for this to be a fair system for people. Um, in terms of the spousal transfer, I would just reiterate that uh, we Minnesota is an outlier in that way. Other states do not do this. And medical debt is an outlier. We don't do that for any other type of debt, only medical debt which makes no sense to me. And so, you know, um, it, it, we, we shouldn't be doing that and, and putting people in a situation that they are responsible for a debt that is not theirs. Um, and so uh, appreciate the comments and, and we'll, you know, this is an important bill that affects many, many Minnesotans and looking to add some fairness to that system. So people can, can pay their bills and get the care that they need both. Senator Adke, any? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and um, this is a hard topic. Um, ironically, we have spent so much effort in helping people who are uh, low income or at risk to uh, you know, co recover them in so many ways. The whole ACA was designed to, to fix stuff, and I remember Rep. Huntley, like, well, we just got to do something. And so we did something, and it was really expensive, and it's actually made some of the very policies that people had before unaffordable with some of the erstwhile improvements that were made, and um, I'm not revisiting that topic, but I don't think it worked. And here we are uh, facing the challenges that hospital, every place we look, every entity that has, that touches this whole topic is, seems to be at risk. And it, <laughs> at some point, somebody has to pay something, but uh, I, I, you know, I, and, but unfair debt collection practices and all that, and I'm, I mean, I'm just, here we are, what a, what a challenge we're in. But I have a, just an entirely different question. The ALS uh, Society put out, or association, put a letter and talked about copay accumulator policies. Um, does somebody know, are copays not included in a deductible? So 
I thought they were, and we were just chatting about that. Um, and so um, that to me seems just a horrible policy. I don't know if any companies actually do that, Madam Chair. Do you know even who knows that answer? Uh, Senator Bolden, I don't know if you have um, experience. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll speak to this, and maybe I will also turn to um, our Assistant Attorney General. Uh, the copay accumulator um, is in the bill, and my sort of experience with this or orientation to this is around the programs through pharmaceutical companies who offer um, like coupons or, or discounts um, for you know, oftentimes very expensive drugs. You'll see, and I, I would just note the letters that are in your packets that are in support of this. There are many, um, and you mentioned one of them. Um, uh, the rare disease uh, groups are also in favor of this because those medications are often exceedingly expensive. Um, and so pharmaceutical companies will offer a, a discount, um, but the amount of that discount, which goes to pay for the drug, does not get counted, if you will, towards the patient's um, uh, you know, portion of that um, uh, copay. And so um, that that's my orientation to that language of the bill, to be sure that um, that uh, amount that is being paid for the drug is getting counted towards that copay. Oh, Madam Chair, maybe I just understand. Um, so Senator Abler. Are these purchases made outside of an insurance policy? So you didn't submit it to insurance. Mm -hmm. You dealt right with the drug company itself, and you paid money uh, as a separate pot of So it didn't go through the EOB process and all that. Is that? Madam oh, Chair, Senator, uh, Senator Abler, my understanding is it would be a, a combination, that perhaps a portion of it has gone through insurance, but it is not all covered by insurance. So a portion of it is paid through a discount through a pharmaceutical company. I'll let your testifier talk about uh, Mr. Hartz. Chair Wickland, um, Senator Abler, this is a situation where a person is has a, a prescription drug that is covered by insurance, um, but their out of pocket for that drug is still like, you know, can be hundreds or thousands yeah. of dollars a month. The uh, drug company will often say to the person, look, because we understand that this is some rare genetic child Disease, you know, disease that your child is dealing with, we will pay for pay for the first you know month every year of your prescription drug. Um, but then what happens is the insurance company uh, does not count that towards the patient's out of pocket uh, limit or or towards their you know their their total for the year. So the person ends up hitting their out of pocket limit anyway, and that that uh, discount that the drug provider is trying to give to the patient really ends up going to the insurance company. So, Madam Chair, I, Senator Abler. we're running out of time. I, if somebody in the industry can talk to me about this, I don't know, I don't want to pursue it now, but it, as my understanding about normal copays, there's a hundred buck charge, there's $40 reduction for usual and customary, the $30 copay, and then they pay 30 bucks or something from the insurance company, and that whole 60 gets, you know, somehow included in the insurance plan, or 30 bucks goes on out of pocket, but, um, hold, <laughs> Madam Chair, we have just created the most convoluted system. We have to have permission to change 170 to 100 beds and move 26 beds across town. And holy, Senator Mann, if only we had single mayor. Is that your? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Is there a motion on the table? There is a motion. I second that motion. Thank you, Senator Abler. Yeah, it, it's very complicated. Um, I think you probably would need to talk, um, you know, the, the amount of the deductible and all of the out-of-pocket out of costs. They have different terms for each part of it. Um, it's hard to make a general statement about how it will work for any given person, but I appreciate your explaining how this, um, this, this section of the bill works. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any other other questions or comments. Senator Bolden, do you have any final thoughts? Madam Chair, I uh, appreciate the time in the committee to hear this bill. Uh, Senator Abler, I, I agree with you. We absolutely need to reform our health care system, which is complicated and convoluted and failing people every day. Um, in the meantime, this is something we can do to, to make the system a little more fair for people who are um, dealing with um, you know exceedingly high medical debt and how that impacts many, many areas of their life. So thank you. And so before um, I forget, I would like to, uh, would you like to move, Senator Bolden, your A1 amendment so we can adopt that? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, members, um, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
the, amend the A1 amendment is adopted. And with that, um, thank you, Senator Bolden, for continuing to work on this. It's a really challenging area, but I really appreciate that we're trying to take steps to, to make things more fair and more uh, reasonable so that people um, can not be burdened with um, really the debt that they can't, can't afford. So thank you for that. And uh, Senate File 4602, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, we have reached the end of our agenda, and this meeting is adjourned.